Welcome to this podcast from Concordia Theological Seminary. I am Dr. Charles Gieschen, and I'm speaking today on the, uh, the Epistle Lesson for Advent 3 Series B, which is from the concluding verses of Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 to 24. That'll be our focus. And as you know, during Advent, we focus on the coming of Christ, uh, certainly uh, getting ready for his second coming, um, celebrating his coming now uh, through word and sacrament, and then also um, preparing for his celebration of his first coming, namely Christmas as it comes upon us uh, after the fourth Sunday in Advent. During Advent 3, there is a brief uh, reprieve from some of the um, preparatory nature of, of Advent. There's uh, Advent 3, Lent 4. There is this stress on rejoicing because the season is almost concluding. It's climaxing with the celebration of Christmas. And you see that theme in our, in our uh, epistle lesson. Um, also, the strong theme of not only rejoicing because of Christ's coming, but also the theme of being spiritually ready, prepared. Uh, you see that coming across in a lot of these imperatives that are found in these concluding verses of First Thessalonians. So with that, those things in mind, and that certainly we can see how this epistle lesson fits in with the season and with the gospel and Old Testament readings, let's move to the text, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, beginning at verse 16. You see here that there are many imperatives. Uh, we see them all the way through, uh, several imperatives. Uh, there's uh, an imperative with a negative. Uh, by the way, this green should be on this verb. Here you have another imperative right here. Uh, another imperative. Another imperative. Uh, and uh, another imperative. So, and then you have the actual blessing uh, from the verse, or excuse me, from the epistle right at the conclusion of this. Why does Paul stack up all of these imperatives? Well, he's coming to the conclusion of his epistle. And very typically, uh, towards the end of his epistles, he does exhortation. He gives encouragement. Uh, and so you see that in these various short phrases. Uh, and it fits very nicely with at the themes of Advent 3, because during the Advent season, we're talking about being spiritually prepared for Christ's coming. And so these imperatives actually fit very well with that theme of spiritual preparation for Christ's coming. Paul starts off in this section, namely verse 16, with rejoice always. Uh, and again, that theme found in, it sounds very much like Philippians where, uh, 4, where, Christ, uh, uh, where Paul writes, Rejoice in the Lord always. Here, a uh, very similar theme earlier, certainly than he wrote Philippians towards the end of his, uh, his um, uh, life. Here you have it in one of his first epistles, that same theme, Rejoice always. And one wonders during this very turbulent time in history, during the challenges that uh, we face, during the, the um, onslaught of another Christmas uh, uh, busyness, uh, how can we rejoice always? Well, I think, again, Philippians gives us the, the theme of rejoice in the Lord. Uh, it's because of what the Lord has done for us that we always have a reason to rejoice. Uh, and so in the midst of any challenges, uh, we continue in light of what Christ has done in his coming, in his death and resurrection for our salvation, that we always have something to rejoice about. Uh, and uh, that's a wonderful reminder that Paul um, gives in this exhortation. In light of Christ's work, to rejoice always. And then another theme very much connected with this spiritual preparation is the exhortation, the imperative, to pray without ceasing. Um, you have this uh, 
very, uh, one might say, seemingly impossible command to pray without ceasing. Uh, what does it mean that Paul exhorts us to pray without ceasing? What he means is to, this is to be part of our daily life that we are, one might say, in conversation with God. We are never kind of just saying, okay, that's for Sunday morning, that's for um, uh, a few seconds before uh, dinner when we pray, or for a devotion after dinner when we have our, our daily devotion, but rather this conversation with God is to be something that is ongoing. Uh, and one can say um, Paul's emphasis on praying without ceasing is really uh, just speaking of the baptismal life. Christ uh, has joined himself to us in baptism, and so he is alive with us, and we are in this uh, daily conversation with um, the Father through Christ. Uh, so praying without ceasing is simply a reflection of our union with Christ, which means we are in daily, um, a constant conversation with God. We're always, you know, as we're going through uh, our daily vocation, um, that's a vital part of it. We're thinking about God's Word. We're thinking about how that impacts our, our thoughts, our decisions, our actions, um, and our words. So that pray without ceasing is not the idea of just sitting down and praying the Lord's Prayer or praying some other prayer, but it's a, a very broad understanding of being in conversation with God. It certainly includes those special prayers that we offer regularly, but it also has a broader meaning of conversation with God. Uh, and that's why you have this um, adverb without ceasing, uh, unceasingly. Uh, then verse 18 continues these exhortations. Um, here, give thanks, and you can see a little relationship between these two. Uh, you have rejoice always. Here, give thanks in all things. Uh, so even when uh, we're going through these challenges, uh, having a, a thankful attitude, again, why can we give thanks in all things? Because we have as the basis for our giving thanks what God has done for us. We see this so often in the Psalter. Why can we offer praise and thanks to God? Why can we give thanks to, to the Lord? For Because we see his benefits. Even in the midst of this sinful world, we see his care for his creation. And also in Christ, we see his redemption of his creation, including our bodies. And that's the foundation for, for our giving of thanks. Uh, on a, on, in all things, even in the midst of struggles and suffering, we give thanks. And that's part of our spiritual preparation as we live in these latter days, uh, is to have this attitude of thankfulness because we are reflecting upon what God has done in creating us and what God has done in redeeming us through his son, Jesus. And then he even drives this point home. Notice these first three exhortations are rather short, but this one is driven home by this phrase. For this, namely, giving thanks in all things. Uh, and I would say you could see this phrase as even governing the other two um, also. So basically all three, these things are the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. And I think this is a very important phrase, namely, uh, he's emphasizing that, that this is what God desires for you, this is his will, but notice how he frames it, in Christ Jesus. Uh, it, these are not things that we can do on our own, but again, the emphasis on the baptismal life, because we are in en Christo, Jesu, we are in Christ Jesus, then this will of God can and is lived out in our lives, namely to rejo be rejoicing always in spite of the challenges that sin brings, to be uh, praying ceaselessly, to be in this daily conversation with uh, our, our God, and then also to be able to give thanks in all things. Uh, he goes on, and the next part of this text is very closely tied together. 
because here he says, do not quench, so you have the imperative again, uh, do not quench the Spirit. And here he's obviously speaking of the Holy Spirit, namely the Spirit given in baptism um, and continued to uh, be um, nurtured in us through the Word of God, through the sacraments. He's saying, do not quench that spirit uh, that is alive within you, that is animating you, that is uniting you with Jesus, empowering your new life. Another way to um, see how, that, how Paul is unpacking that is to look at the next um, two uh, phrases. Namely, again, here's your verb, even though it's not highlighted in green. This highlight should be over this uh, verb. You have, uh, do not... Uh, basically um, stifle prophecy. Here, this language of, of uh, prophecy is speaking about the importance of teaching, or do not despise. A better way of, uh, this, uh, of translating this verb is do not despise prophecy. Uh, and here, uh, Paul, when he uses this language of prophecy, he's speaking really of the prophetic preaching in the church. Um, the, um, just as you have a strong emphasis in the Old Testament of faithful prophets re saying, thus says the Lord, in the, um, in the early church that Paul has helped establish, you have faithful proclaimers, prophetic voices, preachers, and uh, here Paul is emphasizing, do not despise this kind of prophetic preaching, but rather embrace it. You can see how these two imperatives go well together. Do not quench the spirit and do not, do not despise um, prophecy. How is the spirit making um, the word of God known? Through preaching. Uh, the spirit uh, not only is active in the reading of God's word, but in the prophetic proclamation of God's word. And so you can see how Paul is unpacking this first imperative of verse 19 with the imperative in verse 20. Uh, do not uh, quench the Spirit. A way that we don't quench the Spirit is by actually receiving prophes prophetic preaching uh, with uh, respect and, 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 and joy uh, rather than despising it. Uh, uh, again, it's that attitude towards the Word of God, which is the very means of grace uh, for, um, for receiving the Spirit. And think about the fact that during this Advent season, one of the things that we seek to cultivate is the renewed reception of the Word of God through reading it, through studying it, through gathering together to hear it. Uh, that's a vital part of the Advent season is the spiritual renewal through um, the use of the Word of God where the Spirit is active. Okay, then moving on to the next one, verse, verse 21. Again, related to this language of of not, um, uh, dis not, um, not despising this, the, uh, not quenching the spirit and not despising prophecy is verse 21, where it talks about here, dokimazo in Paul often means uh, discern. Uh, it sometimes is translated test, but uh, another way to translate it is discern. So discern everything is to, in light of God's word, look at things carefully. Don't be drawn in uh, or led astray, but rather be discerning. And so the emphasis uh, that sometimes is brought out in, in the language of testing, it's not so much that it's, um, it's uh, putting everything to the test as much as it is discerning um, that this is of of the true teaching. How do you discern things? Based upon the written word of God. Uh, so it's to be in all things to be discerning. Uh, and then to hold fast. Here you have another imperative. Uh, again, these are present imperatives. So the emphasis of these present imperatives is more of a policy command. All these things are to be done habitually, not just one time uh, events, uh, but this is sort of the ongoing um, life of the Christian as we await Christ's return. And so we're to hold fast the noble or good things, uh, the good thing, uh, rather than, so by being discerning, 
we, um, we get rid of that which is evil, but we hold fast to the kalan, to the noble or good thing. Uh, and verse 22 just continues this second part of verse 21, namely the second thought, um, which is to abstain. Here you have the imperative. So here you hold fast. You see the contrast between these two imperatives uh, where you, you, are, um, you are abstaining um, from here. You're abstaining. Here you're holding fast. You can see that contrast. So abstain from every form of evil. And here I would say the form of evil, Paul has talked about these in his epistle earlier. This is everything from idolatry. Remember, Thessalonians were in a very idolatrous um, setting, a city. Uh, pagan temples were to, to, um, to basically abstain from that kind of false worship. But then the, the, the other things in terms of, Paul has talked about a sanctified life, abstaining from sexual immorality, all those things that are forms of evil. So the, what we would call both um, the, uh, the overt idolatry as well as the implicit idolatry, the various things that become our gods we are to abstain with, from. And here one can say, again, this is part of our preparation as we live in these latter days and our preparation for Christ's coming is we not only hold fast to the good things, but we also abstain from the forms, every form, of evil. And so the whole business of repenting of, of that and then living a, a sanctified life. And that sanctified life is brought out beautifully in terms of uh, the blessing that concludes this uh, text. And here you have this language of who is it that offers um, deliverance and blessing? It's the God of peace. So and here, this language of uh, a blessing, um, Paul often concludes several of his epistles with a blessing. This is the one here. Uh, the God of peace, Irene, uh, I think the reason why Paul brings this up is the peace of Rome was a very big theme. Here, Paul contrasts where is peace truly found. It's found in the God who has sent his son. So he is the God of peace. Don't put your hope in a country or an empire, but put your hope in the God who has brought peace with all mankind through Christ. The, the God of peace, here's the intensifier, himself sanctify you. Here's that wonderful word for the Advent season to make holy. God is the one who will sanctify us. Uh, this is something that he does. How does he do it? Through baptism, through his word, through his sacrament that we commune on uh, during this Advent season and certainly in the, um, the in Christmas, um, in the Mass of Christmas, the uh, celebration of the Lord's Supper at Christmas where we receive Christ coming to us. May he sanctify you completely. And so this is a big theme of this blessing is that, uh, Christ, that God will do this work completely. And here uh, he unpacks that a little bit more when he talks about the wholeness of the sanctification that, that God brings about, the God of peace. Uh, so here it's brought out in the sense of keeping you. Here you have the, um, the optative verb so that he will keep your whole, uh, right here, your whole spirit, suke, I'm going to translate that self. It sometimes is translated soul, but I'll translate it self, and body. Here Paul emphasizes the two central aspects of anthropology. Our body, namely God has created us, we have a body, He's going to keep that body into the resurrection. Uh, and our spirit, which has been transformed by the Holy Spirit. We saw the, the, the Holy Spirit mentioned er earlier. This is speaking of our spirit. We're body and spirit. And he has 
breathed his new life into our spirit, making us alive by the Holy Spirit. But he also mentions our suke, our self. This was very important to um, the understanding of, um, of Greco-Romans, uh, having a unique suke, we would uh, transliterate that, our psyche, our unique person, our self. And what Paul is basically emphasizing is that our whole being will be kept, namely uh, our spirit, which has been renewed by the, the Holy Spirit, our unique, um, our unique uh, person, uh, our self, as well as our body. And here the emphasis on the resurrection is very clear. clear. May it be kept blameless. How is this kept blameless? We think of what Christ has done for us through the cross. Uh, his righteousness becomes ours because of his atoning death. And so we are truly holy through faith in Jesus Christ. And he will keep us blameless. Namely, we are forgiven. We are his holy ones. We are his, in, true, in a true sense, not just sinners, but saints through Jesus Christ. Simul justus et peccator certainly can be understood here. Uh, he will be keep, keep us blameless unto the parousia, the triumphal coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is speaking of the last day coming, the parousia, the triumphal visible coming of Christ in the last day. A vital theme of the Advent season certainly brought out in this epistle lesson today. And then a wonderful conclusion, the one calling you, this could be put, I often put these in participles in purple, uh, but this is, the, um, is re referring to the one calling and I would say the emphasis is back to the God of peace. Who is the one calling? The God of peace is the one calling. He calls us through the Spirit into a relationship um, with his Son. He unites us with his Son. So the one calling you, namely the God of peace, is faithful. One of the great characteristics of God throughout the, the New and Old Testament is his faithfulness. We are unfaithful. He is always faithful. He keeps his covenant. He keeps his promises. So um, the one calling you, direct object, is faithful, and, and he will do it. So you have this emphasis on uh, God accomplishing that for us. So uh, getting back to um, just a quick conclusion, we can see how this particular text is a wonderful text in the Advent season to emphasize spiritual preparation. It also picks up on that theme of rejoicing, which is, you know, the Advent season's almost over. We anticipate the celebration of Christmas, uh, and we give thanks always. We pray without ceasing, that kind of spiritual preparation all brought out very clearly in this um, wonderful epistle lesson. May the Lord bless your proclamation and your teaching of the Word of God during this Advent season as we prepare for Christ's coming.